Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. Excellencies, colleagues, friends of the Dag Hammarskjöld Library, ladies and gentlemen, I'm truly delighted to welcome you all here in this room at the United Nations headquarters, and also thrilled to welcome all those of you who have just tuned in to attend this event. My name is Thanos Tianakopoulos. I am the chief librarian of the flagship library of the United Nations of the Department of Global Communications. It is our great pleasure to organize this hybrid conference, which focuses on open science as an accelerator of the implementation of the SDGs and on the need to democratize the record of science. To organize this global event, a hybrid in nature, we have collaborated closely with the Division of Sustainable Development Goals, Department of Economic and Social Affairs, and with the Division of Science Policy and Capacity Building of UNESCO. Of their support, we are truly thankful. For this opening segment of the conference, I'm now honored to invite His Excellency, President of General Assembly Tabo Corossi, to deliver opening remarks. President, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Yanakopoulos, Excellencies, uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to uh, speak to you all today. Uh, bridging the gap between science and decision making has been a cornerstone of my presidency since day one. And I believe that only by doing so, it would be possible to change the way we operate and to efficiently tackle the manifold challenges at hand. There are currently 13 negotiating processes related to transformation underway. 13 pathways for us to reach the vision and ambitions set in the SDGs. Just yesterday, we had briefings by representatives of the scientific community on how science-based evidence can be the key to identifying the implementing sustainable solutions. The briefings were divided into three panels. The new economics on water, climate conflict and cooperation, and early warnings for pandemic preparedness. All of them with the promise of making breakthroughs and identifying game changers for us. The briefings also included an update of the Global Sustainable Development Report 2023, which can provide a solid basis for a strong political declaration at the SDG summit later September. We must adapt to the changing of nature of the world around us, as well as the changing nature of the crisis we face. I'm deeply committed to breaking down the fences and divide the work of the desperate fields. Better inclusion in science is paramount, and it is part of the broader discussion. Data shows that the best and most accurate research accounts for a range of human experiences. Yet we live in societies that have grown divided <clears throat> along arbitrary lines, such as gender, class, caste, religion, or ethnicity. And sadly, this unequal and unfair inheritance also seeped into academia and science. Groups that have been historically marginalized are all too often still de facto excluded from research. But we are in trouble now. And we cannot afford any longer to go without anyone who can bring value to science. In fact, we must mobilize everyone, all our energies, to deal with the challenges. Fostering a culture of open research and access is critical for the uh, democratization of knowledge. As things currently stand, grossly inaccurate misinformation, disinformation and malinformation are freely available online. 
but credible, authoritative, and peer-reviewed scientific, adv uh, scientific advances are guarded by paywalls. From racist conspiracy theories to lies about vaccines, I need not remind uh, this room of the dire consequences of the spreading false information can have. The pandemic cast a stark light on the importance of having accurate, science-driven information easily and freely accessible, particularly online. And it puts us, uh, and it put us be, uh, before the urgency of strengthening the science policy society interface. The good news I brought to you this morning, this interface is being further developed as we speak. We all know how far off track we are on the achievements of the uh, achievement of the SDGs. So, what are we going to do? What should we change to do right? There is no other way uh, for us to reach SDGs than to transform how we relate to each other and how we deliver global public goods. Because the crises we face are interconnected, so too must be our solutions. The science of, of complexities is the science of the SDGs. Sharing our knowledge on open access online platforms will, uh, will only be de uh, detrimental to those who do not want to uh, want a just and fair world. But something else is missing, still missing. We are still lacking the science-based, simple, flexible, adaptable to various conditions of countries, methodology of measuring sustainability transformation. How could we expect breakthroughs in the implementation of the real transformation to sustainable world while we are not prepared to measure it? That is my strong request and appeal to, to you all. Please help us developing this powerful tool we call Going Beyond GDP. It has been long overdue, and there is no reason to let it missing further. The adage goes that science does not bring about answers, only more questions. That's fine. Let us strive to, to always listen to these questions and always listen to those asking them. Let us improve how we work and how we work together. Never forgetting the words of the French philosopher Claude Bernard, art is I, science is we. Thank you. Thank you very much for these very moving words. Um, I would like uh, now move to our next uh, speaker for the opening remarks, and that is uh, our Undersecretary General for Global Communication, Melissa Fleming. Thank you so much, Thanos, for the introduction. And I also thank His Excellency, Mr. Saba Karoshi, the President of the United Nations General Assembly. Those were very insightful and inspiring words. I think we all agree. Um, also, just such a warm welcome to everyone present today and also to those watching online. Um, it's really a great pleasure to address this third United Nations Open Science Conference delivered under the theme Accelerating the Sustainable Development Goals, Democratizing the Record of Science, spearheaded by the Dag Hammarskjöld Library of the UN Department of Global Communications and in collaboration with uh, the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, uh, its Division of Sustainable Development Goals, and UNESCO. Together, we have convened a group of eminent speakers and who, who will uh, explore the conference's theme from various professional angles. I think the President of the General Assembly has also given you an additional um, challenge uh, around GD, uh, GDP. Um, 
it's been three long years since the COVID pandemic hit. In fact, I think uh, it is almost exactly three years uh, since it was declared a global emergency, bringing our world to a standstill. And while the world was bat battling a health crisis, the pandemic showed us so much the criti critical importance, but also the challenge of sharing scientific and communicating scientific knowledge. Um, there was an unprecedented exchange of scientific data and information. This led to the swift sequencing of the COVID-19 genome and also the miraculous creation of the vaccine to protect humanity in record time. Um, UNESCO's recommendation of open, recommendations of open science gave us international standard setting instrument to define also the shared principles for open science. So we're already seeing new policies on open access to publicly funded research included in the data. Um, these, are, these are being launched in South America and North America, the European Union, Africa, Oceania, and Asia. Um, and to 2023 has been declared the year of open science by the United States in an effort to streamline national policies to advance open and equitable public access to research. Unfortunately, at the same time as you know, all of these new focus on the positive um, aspects of science, we've also seen uh, the dark side, uh, waves of misinformation and particularly disinformation, disinformation which is the deliberate um, malicious uh, attempts uh, to discredit science. Um, and this has been disseminated freely and with incredible speed on the internet. Um, happening while credible peer-reviewed publicly funded research, as you said, remained behind paywalls or are not surfaced uh, by platform algorithms. I mean, I think we could have a whole session also on how we as um, those who support science and who, those who are scientists can better communicate uh, to, to compete with the, you know, emotive, the emotively driven um, disinformation actors who are trying to discredit. So I'd like to just point out that we, um, you know, at the same time when the COVID pandemic hit and when it hit and as WHO was declaring an infodemic um, as well, we here at UN headquarters um, and um, in uh, collaboration with, with the Secretary General's also alarm at what he was seeing um, being communicated, uh, we realized that this was not just a global health, health crisis, but it was a communications crisis as well. And so we, my department launched an, an initiative called Verified, which, which, was, which had an aim, um, which was to flood the internet with accurate science-based factual content around COVID-19. Um, and again, to take, um, to take kind of the dry, you know, PDF document where on page 54 you might find the nugget of information you might really want and to turn those into like nuggets also of, of really engaging content with public health guidance behind it in multiple languages and, and, and actually, you know, call on the UN's already vast network around the world, our country offices, but our, you know, media partners and, you know, so many people who wanted to help and to do good we called them information volunteers to take this content and to redistribute in, in networks. We found that, um, you know, for, for a, in the context of a pandemic, um, a kind of top-down headquarters approach was not working very well, and nor was our using, we leveraged our celebrity supporters, but it was actually the micro-influencers at the community level that had the most impact. And we were able to give them some of the tools, some of the training, um, and also asking the platforms like TikTok and others to help you know, verify them and train them and to get them to speak uh, to their audiences in their languages um, in, you know, about, in human, human ways about um, what was happening, what we know, and what people can do to protect themselves. So, um, you know, we... This gave rise to our wider concern um, 
of, about the social media giants um, and looking at the design flaws that really um, prioritize um, you know, business over um, facts and um, outrage um, over <laughs> science. Um, so um, we, yeah, we, we have uh, very much to do in this area and, and we are, um, the, the, uh, you may have seen that the Secretary General um, launched a report at last year's General Assembly um, called Our Common Agenda which is really, um, you know, it will help to also turbocharge, turbocharge the SDGs, but also it, it goes beyond that and has many um, streams of work that will um, help us to create a better world. And that I know the president of the General Assembly is really mobilizing um, uh, around this. And one of those work streams um, has been assigned to us, and that is to create a code of conduct on um, information integrity on digital platforms. And, um, but, you know, in general, we have you know, quite a while to work on this, but it's very clear that we are going to be working to set the kind of guardrails to make the digital sphere more humane. I think what we've all found and seen in this time is with the rise of, of social media and digital is, you know, you know, wonderful. More and more people can be connected. More and more people can access science, facts, and information. Um, but at the same time, um, there is really is, as I said, a dark side. And what we're seeing is that our information ecosystems are polluted. Um, they're even toxic in many places. And it's it, exactly like the environment. When you have too much toxicity, you have an imbalance. And this is what we have right now. And we, you cannot have healthy societies with a toxic information ecosystem. Um, trust is being eroded. Trust in science, trust in facts, trust in inf institutions. So a key element is going to be a, to address the accountability of these social media platforms for the dangerous side effects of their business models. Um, and we will be also, of course, vigorously defending the right to freedom of expression while doing so. Um, but we really feel that Scientists, academia, institutions, librarians, research funding agencies, and publishers all have a, have a crucial role to play. You know, the Nobel Peace Prize winning um, Maria Reza, I've just finished her book um, called How to Talk to a Dictator, but it is a lot about this. It's about how a journalist um, who is, you know, really um, playing that role of, of um, you know, providing people with with, uh, with information that they could trust um, and embracing social media at the beginning as a way to kind of turbocharge the facts, found that um, the opposite was happening. And she, in the end, has you know, called on everyone to, col she to collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. We can't do this alone. We need an all of society approach to create um, an information ecosystem where the facts, the science um, can thrive and can emerge and can be trusted. So um, yeah, open science is obviously very key here and um, driving force behind the democratization of the research cycle connector among science policy society interfaces um, and also a regional impetus for regional development. Um, so, Ladies and gentlemen, let me um, just finally say a few words um, about the Dag Hammarskjöld Library, which has initiated this series of conferences um, in scholarly communications, which uh, is also helping us to help the science um, move to the forefront in the service. Um, there was one on open access in 2018, on open science 2019, 2021, and today. Um, and just to say that our library um, in UN headquarters has been preserving the history of the United Nations since 1945. And as reflected in official documents, publications, speech, speeches, voting data, and other research materials. And in 2018, it launched its digital library, um, which is so important, again, um, to allow people to research, to access, um, and it's an open repository bringing the deliberations, decisions, and actions of all the UN organs, main organs, to 
the fingertips of researchers. Um, so it, combine, it caters to a combined audience of more than a million clients per month. So I'd really like to thank uh, our colleagues at the library under the leadership of our chief librarian, Thanos, um, Gianni Coppolis. Uh, you said it perfect, Gianna Coppolis. I should know this. I just call him Thanos all the time. So, and uh, you know, but Greece does produce some some very challenging names and wonderful. <laughs> okay, not only Greece, Hungary, um, uh, and in close collaboration with Ms. Astra Bonini from the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs and Ms. Anna Persich from UNESCO, who put this conference together for you. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers. I wish you all an engaging, inspiring, and thought-provoking and fruitful conference focused on solutions and the way forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Under Secretary General Fleming, or Melissa. <laughs> um, um, I, I would like now to uh, invite uh, uh, Ms. Maria Francesca Spatolisano, Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs from the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, our usual collaborator in organizing these open science conferences. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Thanos. And Excellency Mr. Xaba Kuroshi and uh, Melissa, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this third Open Science Conference. This conference gives us a chance to examine bold ideas and to ensure that science delivers for people and planet in the most inclusive and productive ways possible. Dear colleagues, in 2015, the world came together to make an inspiring commitment. You all know the 2030 agenda. But progress was slow, was uneven, and uh, uh, then came the pandemic, uh, followed in rapid succession by conflict, cost of living crisis, and inflationary and debt pressure on many countries. So amid all these shocks, as the President of General Assembly said, we are far off track towards achieving the SDGs. And many people around the world, in fact, face hunger, starvation, water shortages, poor living conditions altogether, problems that we thought by now would have been left behind. So if there is hope, and there is hope for the future, it will rest, we believe, on human ingenuity and scientific and technological advances. Climate change cannot be tackled without clean energy technologies and, for instance, battery storage. Modern day diseases, as it was mentioned, cannot be solved without advanced medicine, genomics, immunology, and you name it, research in the scientific field. The food crisis cannot be addressed without heat resistant crops, green fertilizers, climate smart technologies. So all these need extraordinary breakthroughs driven by science and accelerated through partnership, let me highlight. And when knowledge flows freely and efficiently between people, scientific communities, and countries, such breakthroughs are far more likely. So ladies and gentlemen, if you allow me, I will share with you briefly six areas where some reimagining we think is necessary. One, creative solutions for sharing knowledge rather than hiding it behind the publishing paywalls need to be found. And existing models that work need to be scaled up. Science should be in the public domain as this is the core of our conference today. Public-private partnership could be explored with no profit imperative, and regulations are also helpful in this case because public funds for research can impose the requirement that the resulting research and data be open access. Second, the digital divide. The digital divide is real and is leaving many groups of people cut off 
from information flows that impact their lives. Melissa spoke about the misinformation, but there is a lot of useful information out there. And even more so after the COVID-19 pandemic, we are deeper into a digital world. Um, two thirds of the global population is using internet, was using internet in 2022. And this was uh, up from 2019, where it was only just above 50%. And young people, of course, remain the driving force of connectivity because in that group of age, 75% of them use uh, are online and use internet. So tackling access, price affordability, and filling the digital skills gap together with open science will unleash the potential of young, but also less young, let's say, and creative minds. <laughs> I'm only young, <laughs> speak for myself, <laughs> irrespective of where they are physically located. So third point uh, is that scientists need to act as development brokers uh, for communities, for nations, and the disciplines they are in, bringing all this knowledge to bear on the very challenging problems they face and we all face. And this requires that markers of a successful scientific career are aligned with the common good. Incentives for those doing science must be re-examined and, and looked into, and rewards for working on real problems that matter should be the real rewards, and for communicating findings to those outside the academic circles. And I go, then fourth point is trust. I go where Melissa was as well. There is an issue of trust, of course, in modern scientific knowledge, which was even more clear during the COVID-19 pandemic, where there was in fact a pandemic of false information as well. And people were struggling to believe in vaccines and science, even when their lives depended on it, our lives. So open science needs to be developed in step with people and communities so that from a young age, people have a scientific temperament, I would call it, and can make informed judgment. Fifth is the principle of inclusiveness and equity in scholarships. And this is very important. <coughs> this conference will discuss it, so I won't uh, uh, dwell on this, but it's very important so that people are also creators of content and problem solvers and not just users. And finally, the interface. The science and policy makers must be able to interact and work together. It is essential to strengthen the science policy interface. Decision makers on one end and communities need access to scholarly publication to be able to make well-informed decisions. At the UN, we are committed to strengthening this interface and to bring together the stakeholders to form new partnership and share knowledge. And I give you two examples. One is uh, the uh, support we give in my department to, to the publication of the Global Sustainable Development Report, which was already referenced, uh, a, a set of independent scientific uh, experts and leaders uh, get together and, and assess what could be helpful for us to reach the SDGs. And we also, uh, organize, as you know, the annual multi-stakeholder science, technology, and innovation forum. And the SDG summit this September will look at science and evidence for ways to accelerate the progress towards the SDGs in the second half of our journey towards 2030. So, dear friends, by working together to share ideas and advance open science, we can overcome the challenges that realities we face and give substance to our commitment also to leave no one behind. And I encourage you during this conference to boldly imagine the future of open science and the best design possible. So to ensure that science and technology have a transformational impact on people's life. And I thank you for your attention.